All righty. Hello there. This is the Indie Investor Mini Course with me, Tyler Lingle, Realtor, Investor. And in this course, we're going to be talking about all about how to start investing in Indianapolis. And this is geared towards complete beginners or people maybe early intermediate. You're just getting into it, getting the ground beneath you. So without further ado, let's get into it. So first of all, topics that we're actually going to cover in this mini course. Uh, number one, general principles for investing in Indianapolis. Think of this as like, why Indianapolis? What do you, what is the fingerprint, so to speak, of Indianapolis? Number two, overview of locations. Um, we're going to go into my investor map. And then um, number three, how to run the numbers effectively. So how do you run the numbers within the confines of Indianapolis, our taxes, our insurance, you know, everything within Indianapolis, what you need to pay attention to. And then we're going to break down the four main strategies for investing. Um, there are more, but these are the primary ones. Um, Long-term uh, placing a tenant in for at least a year. Midterm, which is usually um, three to six month uh, short-term stays in a furnished unit. Short-term rental like Airbnb, VRBO, uh, Burr strategy, buy, um, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat, super popular um, within the bigger pockets realms. And then number five, action steps. Um, how, what, what are the actions that you actually should take um, within um, getting started with investing? So without further ado, let's break into it. A bit about me. Um, why should you listen to Tyler Engel? Um, well, I'm in the top 2% of MIBOR or Indianapolis realtors. So I've gotten to sell a lot of real estate, see a lot of people, people's successes, but also failures, um, unfortunately too, which gives me an inside look into the market and deals. Um, I have kind of helped pioneer this, this uh, idea of investor-friendly agent in Indianapolis um, doing well over 45 investor deals within the past two years that I've been an agent in Indianapolis. Um, I've done over 20 million in transaction volume in this time. I have personally seven units. Um, I've done a burr. I think I have one extra R there. <laughs> I have a short-term rental in Christian Park. I have a quad. And so four of those units are within a quad. Um, so I've had a nice sample of multiple different strategies and seeing what works, um, still investing currently. And then I co-founded our realty team, Roots Realty Co., um, helping people plant roots in Indianapolis. Um, and then um, I've been on some of these podcasts, which I'm sure you can search my name and find them. So let's get right into it. My little bubble is a little too big. There we go. Let's make it smaller. Why Indianapolis? Um, there are kind of five different big reasons why I think Indianapolis is a phenomenal market. Employment trends. Um, generally speaking, when you look at national data right now, the national data as of August 2023, we have about three and a half percent unemployment, I believe. Indianapolis is more like two and a half. So we're consistently under the national average for unemployment. We have a phenomenal jobs market. Back in 2022, uh, the stat was for every one person, there's two jobs available, which is just boggles my mind. Um, so great jobs market, population growth. We're not growing like, you know, Florida or Texas. However, for the Midwest, we are one of the few states adding people every single year. So Indy, we have about 1.5 to 3% population growth per year on average. Um, the suburbs around Indy are, are just exploding. So Hamilton County, I checked the statistics, it grew almost 30% from 2010 to 2020. So um, Indianapolis is steadily growing, um, but then surrounding areas are really exploding, um, which all those are, are adding people to um, businesses, restaurants, um, and, and jobs in Indy. So it just adds to even more growth, right? Um, another one is the gentrification. Um, Fountain Square, the top out of the market around 2010 was about 196,000. 
The highest priced home in Fountain Square is now around 900,000. And that's happening in multiple markets across Indianapolis. So we're seeing this gentrification, this renewal of the urban um, indie areas. Mixed in with that, um, you have affordability. So according to um, NASDAQ, um, we are the sixth most affordable large metropolitan area in the nation. Um, now we do have some challenges within that, which is the housing stock. Um, a lot of the homes in Indianapolis are older than you might think, built in 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, they can have older foundations, older electrical and older problems, especially within urban Indianapolis where the prices are more favorable for investors. I know this, um, the average age of the homes that I own, we're sitting around 1930. Um, this home that I'm sitting in right now is 1920. So I'm no stranger to all those things. Um, and then crime. Crime recently has been an issue. Um, per capita, we have more crime than Chicago. And I hesitate to even say that because I don't want to scare people off because I've, I've never had a shooting at one of my properties. Um, I've always felt safe, no, almost no matter where I'm at in Indianapolis. However, um, on certain intersections and areas of town, um, it, it, there are bad reputations of these places and um, a real danger. So um, that's something to consider. All right. Now, again, why Indianapolis? Um, I love this data showing some macroeconomic trends. So housing values. Right here, we see in Indianapolis, um, this is from about 1970 to now. We see um, in economic downturns, um, especially as of late, Indianapolis fares relatively well. In fact, we only declined 5.5% after the 2008 crash, whereas nationally there was a 23% um, reduction in values. Um, and then if you zoom in here, um, our uh, dip was a very quick dip uh, post uh, 2022, um, whereas nationally we're still kind of um, sitting lower. It's hard to tell because it's so zoomed in. But Indianapolis traditionally, because of our jobs market, because of our steady growth, because of our affordable prices, we don't have the same pendulum swing backwards as say a Vegas or a SoCal or a Southern Florida does, um, it's a very safe, insulated market with steady growth. Taking a look here, you can see from 2010 to 2021, when this data ends, you can see population steadily growing. We're just like steady Eddie. It's kind of the name of the game here at in Indianapolis. Um, I wanted to include this. This shows where the population trends are um, heading in terms of the dark areas being more densely populated, Hamilton County really exploding, Hendricks as well, and then um, South Side, Greenwood, Center Grove area, and then a little bit on the east side, although it's late blooming. Um, but primarily, investors are investing um, in Marion County, all of Indianapolis, technically by address um, and city limits, is uh, Indianapolis. So all of Marion County is Indianapolis. Um, so you may be investing in the suburbs. However, usually the values are higher and it's harder to make those numbers work to make the rents catch up to the mortgage, but primarily investors are looking within Marion County, um, to find their deals in my experience. Why Indianapolis jobs? Again, the key word you want to invest where there are jobs that will lead to population growth and value increases um, and also rent increases. So just to name a few, we uh, with the passing of the CHIPS Act with Joe Biden, we have Indianapolis vying to get some of those processing plants actually out in Lebanon and Northwest Indianapolis area. LEAP is what they're calling it. Um, it's a massive development out there um, to become a tech hub. We have a tech hub that already um, broke ground and they're just moving tons of dirt out in uh, the near west side of Indianapolis, 16 tech over there in kind of the Riverside neighborhood. Um, IU Health is building a 4.9 billion, again, that's a not a that's not a million, that's a billion dollar facility uh, on the near north side. It's the largest medical development currently underway in the United States. Um, and then Roger Penske recently took over the Speedway 
He's a billionaire. He's staking his legacy on the Speedway, investing already millions of dollars. And all of this is investment in Indianapolis leading to further jobs and a good narrative. Here on the ground, the narrative is strong in Indianapolis. People are liking what they're seeing. And then just to really hit the point home, um, IBJ, Indianapolis Business Journal, released this um, little uh, image here, which is $9 billion in projects filling the pipeline in just downtown. So you can see we have 16 tech, $600 million development over here. Um, another one that wasn't in the last slide is Alenco's world headquarters. That's going to provide over 600 jobs with the median salary over 100,000 on the near um, southwest side. Um, and just a whole host of developments. I'm sure you can pause the screen and read over these. Um, coming to the downtown area of Indianapolis. Uh, we have a lot of big out-of-state money coming in, and this is pouring into central Indianapolis, which is spilling over in the other neighborhoods where people live in and um, come to Indianapolis to work and play. Um, I have another map on my website, tylerengo.com slash invest with Tyler, that um, is more broadly the full Indianapolis, so Marion County, which you can check out um, there. Okay, now we're going into part two of this uh, mini course, which is now um, locations. So um, in this map, um, we're showing kind of class A, B, C, um, and D, um, and uh, I do want a disclaimer, uh, Tyler Lingle and our real estate team worth the entire in Indianapolis area, and we are committed to being equal housing providers. So anywhere in this map we provide, we work in, um, we want to support you if you want to buy real estate here. That being said, there are definitely different levels of risk involved. So the best areas are going to be central downtown where it's already super gentrified, the near north side, Fountain Square, parts of the near east side. And then we have Avon, sort of Brownsburg, Carmel, Fishers, Noblesville, Zionsville. These are um, super expensive areas where the median price is over 300,000. Um, and these are fully for appreciation. So if you want appreciation only, you don't care about making money at all, then go buy a single family home in Carmel without an HOA, um, you'll do great. Um, if you want more cash flow, which a lot of the people that I tend to work with do, then we're going to be looking a lot in these B and C areas. These are where the values of the rents and your mortgage, your rents will be higher than your mortgage and you can cash flow. There are also more renters living in these areas. So people looking for rentals. Um, so we're talking like areas like Speedway, Irvington, Beach Grove, South Broad Ripple, Bates Hendricks. These are phenomenal areas. They all have um, a positive narrative. People are liking what they're seeing there. More people are moving there. More young people are moving there. Um, and then some of these other areas are solid areas for cash flow. They may not be the most trendy areas of town. So Twin Air, um, we have the Near East Side, which is broadly this area. Lots of older housing stock. We have lots of pockets. So if you see here this Dark green, thin little thread there is Woodruff Place, right next to Tuxedo Park, traditionally a more um, impoverished area of town, um, right next to each other. And that's just kind of the thing in the Near East Side. So it's a very dynamic area with tons of gentrification pushing outwards from Indianapolis, but also pushing this way from Irvington, um, kind of smushing there in the middle. I own three properties on the Near East Side. I think it's a fabulous area of time to invest in, but very pockety. And you could get mixed up in, the, in a bad area if you're not paying attention or using an investor friendly agent to help you there. Um, Devington, Devington's going to be, um, around this area. Um, actually kind of up around here in this lighter green, orangish area, little flower. That's going to be just like West Northwest of Irvington, um, community Heights, Emerson Heights over here. Um, Morris Hills, actually this red area here. Um, I have a C class. It's, you know, sort of C, C minus area. Um, but broadly speaking, if I'm looking at this map, I'm trying to avoid the red. If I'm an investor seeking um, a safe, livable area, and I'm mostly going to be looking at places close to the green, 
um, surrounding proxim um, proximity areas in the line of development. Orange and yellow is totally fine, like green is great um, in general. Um, and this map um, can be made available to you. Um, just let me know. I used to have a public. Um, I don't at the current moment, but maybe put it back to being public. And yeah. Okay, so really quickly here, I want to um, take you to um, this um, map, which actually can be found at my website, tellingwell.com slash, I promise this won't all just be a plug for me, but taking you into this. Okay, so we have an investor guide if you want to get that right here. Um, a little blurb about the market, some podcasts. But if you go down here, stay on the pulse, you can open up this map and then you open it. Um, you can see all these various um, developments that we have here. Um, I did color code them. So these are business developments in purple, um, medical, um, or parks. Um, multifamily and then neighborhoods. So if you're wanting to be in cool neighborhoods that are improving and that are relatively walkable, these yellow areas are going to be where you're going to want to be, um, in the surrounding areas. Um, and this is not the extent of developments in Indianapolis, but just wanted to highlight this, um, for you. Okay. Moving on. Okay, running the numbers. Um, so, starting off first, cash flow um, is what we're aiming for. Um, unless you're just investing for appreciation, meaning you're okay with losing money every month if your rent's super high and your mortgage is down here, and the value of the property is increasing, you know, two percent, three percent, five percent a year, you may want that, but that's going to cost you money. Um, but um, in terms of most investors, most investors want to make money every single month. Um, and you have to make sure your income, which is generally rent, um, sometimes there's other ways of collecting rent, minus expenses is positive. Um, and then people like to categorize um, their investment in terms of cash on cash ROI. So something like eight to 12% and above is a really strong cash on cash return. And what does that mean? That means if you calculate how much your money you're making every month, say it's a hundred bucks times 12 for 12 months of the year, it's um, $1,200 divided by your initial cash investment. Let's say you bought um, the property with $20,000 down. Um, it'll spit you out a percentage. And again, right now the market is tough due to interest rates and higher values. Um, so honestly, 5% cash and cash is not bad right now, but something like, eight to 12 is really strong and generally a good benchmark number. Um, income, um, generally it's just rents. It's the thing about, um, properties you generally just are making money through rents. Sometimes you have, um, in, in small apartment buildings or apartment buildings, coin laundry, you can charge for garage or a pet fee, but, um, mostly rent. Your expenses are a little more variable. You have your mortgage. Of course, if you have a mortgage taxes, um, um, insurance, owner's insurance, which landlords do have to have maintenance, um, you know, got a leak that you got to fix, whatever, stuff like that. Capital expenditures, which we'll get into, and then your management. Generally managers are eight to 12% in Indianapolis. Most of the ones I work with are 10% if you want a property manager. Capital expenditures are what you're going to make sure you're paying attention to, um, in terms of the numbers, one capital expenditure can wipe out a whole year of cash flow. Um, just keep that in mind. So a new roof is going to cost you eight to twelve thousand. Um, HVAC together, meaning AC unit, and then a furnace together would be around six to seven thousand. Um, and then electrical um, to rewire a house, you could be looking at fifteen plus thousand. Plumbing, same thing, fifteen plus thousand to replumb a house. Usually, you don't have to do the whole thing unless you're flipping a property or it's in major disrepair. But something to note. Um, Sewer line, 
um, people forget about this one, but if you um, don't do a sewer scope and you forget to check the sewer line and have to replace it and excavate the area and replace it, that could be up to $15,000. So it's very important when, important when you're buying a property, you do a sewer inspection. Um, and water heaters are usually about one to $2,000 to replace. So these are very important. You look at an inspection report and pay attention to these. Um, these, these do play into your month to month costs because you wanna make sure capital expenditures, you're assessing for these when running the numbers. We're actually gonna run the numbers together on a property using my spreadsheet. So hang on, we will get into how you run the numbers, um, but just take note of this for now. Now, when I'm talking about cash on cash return, I wanna to refer to this little um, figure here. Um, so what we have here is an example property. Um, rent is, let's just call it $1,000, your mortgage is 500. When you calculate per month, your taxes and insurance 50 a piece, maintenance CapEx, we have a budget of 200, let's say, management 10%, 100. What would your cash flow be on this? It's very easy. You take your income minus your expenses. So 500, 50, 50, it's 600, 800, 900. So your cash flow is 100 per month. If we're trying to configure your cash and cash ROI, then we need to know your yearly cash flow, which is going to be 1200 per year. And then this is where you configure how much did you initially have to invest in the property? Um, so let's just say it was a $20,000 down payment and $5,000 in closing costs. So let's take 1200 divided by 25,000 and we'll see what that gets me. So 4.8, so this is an average rental property ROI. You have 4.8 cash and cash return on investment because yearly you're making this much and you initially invested this much. Um, so this is how you calculate cash and cash ROI. So you just have to know what your rent can be, what your um, expenses will be, and then you can easily configure cash on cash ROI. If you need to know what rent could be, we're going to get into that. We're going to um, use some tools, but hang with me. All right. Back, back into the presentation. Okay. So breaking down the various strategies in Indianapolis, um, the most common one is buy and hold, buying a basic rental property, putting a tenant in there, um, and collecting rent checks. And you're going to make money through your cash flow per month, your appreciation of the property, and your amortization or equity pay down of the loan. So investment properties make money uh, actually four different ways because we also have tax benefits. Um, you get to um, write off the depreciation of the property as well, which can have tax benefits. So you want to make sure you're paying attention to that. Things to make sure you're paying attention to is generally I recommend people start with single family or small multifamily, lower stakes, easier to grasp. So a residential um, property is one to four units. Once you get into five plus, you're getting into a commercial property, completely different world. You're gonna need a commercial loan. Um, and those are generally always adjustable rate more um, mortgages. Yeah, they are mortgages, but totally different world. So usually a little more advanced. Um, a good deal is going to be eight to 10% cash on cash ROI when you run the numbers on a long-term rental. We're going to run the numbers on a deal. Um, just hold tight. We will get there. Uh, short-term rentals. A lot of people ask me, can I do a short-term um, rest rental in Indianapolis? Yes. It's a great market. Currently, there are no restrictions. Um, in 10 years, will that be the case? I don't know. I'm not sure. Although right now it's very hands off um, in terms of the government, but location preference is going to be huge. So generally speaking, you're going to have two main areas to focus on in Indianapolis. That is the north side near Grant Park, massive sports facility. You also have the Carmel area, the Carmel Arts District and Midtown area, which is super popular for tourism. Um, and then downtown. Downtown, we have a large convention, what seems like every single month. Um, 
You have Catholic youth workers, firefighters, Comic-Con, Gen Con, tons of conventions um, in Indianapolis. Um, so within 10 minutes drive is solid. Um, and surprisingly, I've seen, you know, good short terminals in Avon and Hendricks County. Like you, you can do it in these areas. There is a need. Um, however, the tried and true would be more north side um, and then downtown. Um, you want to think with a short term rental on utility. So how is it going to be used? If you have a use case for the property, you will obviously have good ROI. So headcount is important. The more door, you know, the more, excuse me, heads you can fit in the property, the better. Also unique experience. So my wife and I bought a property, um, a little boat, a little bungalow in Christian park, not even the best area, call it a C plus neighborhood. And it just looked like it could have the aesthetic appeal to be a short-term rental. So we made like a boho theme. We've got like wicker and rattan everything, some cool rugs, some good art. And because it's a unique experience for the price point, it's doing really well. It is, it is making um, a fair amount of money every single month. So thinking about um, how your short-term rental will be used. A good deal is going to be, I put 10 to 20, I think 15% or more cash from cash ROI. And you're going to want to configure the occupancy rate your, and your nightly rate. So if your nightly rate in Indianapolis, a four bedroom, two bath home could probably have a nightly rate of like 225. Let's just call it. And you can use Airbnb or you can use airdna.co to find these comps. I'm not going to run through how to run the numbers on a short term rental. I'll save that for a future video. But then you run your nightly rate and then you have your occupancy. Common occupancies in Indianapolis is 50 to 70%. So let's call it 60. So you'd multiply 250 times 30 nights for a month times 60 um, to get that rent rate. Um, and that's how you're running the numbers. You will also have more costs because you have to furnish it. I think a good rule of thumb is about two to 3,000 a room, um, a three bedroom, two bath house, should be able to be furnished under 15,000. I could certainly, I think we could pull it off for more like 8,000, but um, some people um, seem to need more. So there's that. Uh, Midterm rental. This is becoming hugely popular. Ever since COVID, large amounts of travel worse con uh, nurse contracts um, and also just people in more transitional jobs where They'll stay in an area for a bit of time and then leave or younger people trying out the city. They want a furnished stay so they don't have to commit. And um, this is becoming just crazy popular here in Indianapolis as elsewhere. So they're generally three to six month stays. I recommend having a lease um, on the property. Um, you can do a multifamily. You just want to make sure that's okay with other tenants in the property. Um, and then generally a good deal is going to be 10 to 15% cash and cash ROI. Generally speaking, the rent I'm finding is double the long-term. So if your long-term rent is 800 a month, you should be able to get 1600 with a midterm rental furnished. Um, maybe a little less on average, but thereabouts. Um, you can find comps on airdna.co or Airbnb. Um, and then... Generally, people are listing this on Airbnb. They're making a minimum stay of, say, three months or VRBO. VRBO is a little less common, but you see it. And then also Furnish Finder. For travel nurses, a lot of them register on Furnish Finder. And this is a huge um, website platform to find um, furnished guests to stay at your property. I have personally used it. It was a pretty good experience. Um. Now, these are more value add strategies. So if you're looking to build equity quickly and buy a discounted property, add value to it and increase the value past what you invested in it, you're going to want to flip or do a burr. Um, this is not a flipping seminar, so I'm not going to go super in depth into flipping. I'm just going to mention it here. Um, you want to make sure you're in a developing or gentrifying area of town or a good area, so to speak, the worst house on the best street kind of how to think about um, flipping. You don't want to be the first one to do it necessarily. You're going to want to use sold comps um, to investigate this. Use a realtor. Um, you got to factor in your holding and closing costs. So factor in 
the interest you're paying if you have a short money loan, a hard money loan, um, factor in your taxes, your insurance, um, your utilities, people forget about that. Um, also your closing costs when you buy, but also when you sell, a realtor is usually gonna charge you around 6%. Three goes to the buyer, three goes to the listing agent. Um, and then about one to 2% and other closing costs. So factor in about 7% of the property purchase price when you sell for closing costs. Um, a good deal, what I'm seeing right now is profits have thinned in flips as um, it's just harder to find um, really discounted deals. They're really competitive still. Um, about 20,000 or plus in profit. A really good flip is gonna be forty, fifty thousand dollars in profit. That's a really good flip in this market. Um, a burr. Um, again, buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. The reason why people do this is because you can buy the property at a certain purchase price, fix it up, re refinance it at a higher rate, and get a cash out um, refi usually of 75% of that ARV or that um, after repair value and sometimes get all of your money back. So that's the perfect cash out um, burr. However, I have not even seen this really since 2018. There, there's very few cash out burrs. Um, and the ones that are cash out are going to be more like gut jobs, massive deals at higher price points and a lot more risky. So um Keep in mind that leaving ten to fifteen thousand dollars in the deal once you refinance is is very normal. This is this is very normal. Um, the formula that you're going to use when you're looking for a solid burr is going to be this: take seventy five percent of your after repair value minus the rehab costs. And I wrote challenging because uh, I've been looking at deals all day every day, and I, I see very few that match this criteria, but. This is the criteria. Um, you're also going to make sure it cash flows post refinance. So put in a loan calculator, what the after repair value is and um, what that loan will cost you and what your rent will be and make sure it's going to make money after you refinance. Right now, due to higher interest rates in 2023, um, it, that, is, that is a real challenge with burrs. And I'm finding burrs are more often used to increase the velocity of capital and generate um, and build equity, excuse me, really quickly. Less so for cash flow right now. Um, just keep that in mind. So I did do a burr. Um, I'm going to break this down really quickly here. But um, I found this property actually on Facebook through a wholesaler. And wholesalers are generally cash only, no inspections, quite risky at, at times. But I found this deal. He marked it at, at 120. I got it for 110. A little under what they're asking. I, I valued the as is property for this property as 130. So I thought I was getting 100, getting 20 in equity as I bought it. But the renovation cost me about 31,000. Um, my all in number then was 141. My ARV was 185. So um, when I do a cash out refinance, which I actually haven't done quite yet, I'd have finished the renovation. As you can see here, um, but 75% of this ARV will be 138,750. Um, so I'm getting almost all of my all in amount out. I'm going to leave about 3000 in the deal, so to speak, but that means I'm getting a rental property for 3000. You can't do that with a normal investment, 20% down loan. Um, now my monthly payment with taxes and insurance is around 1200 and my rent is only 1375. So if you really factored in the full costs of owning a rental property, including maintenance and management, this won't cash flow post refinance, um, unfortunately for me. So this was more for adding equity in my pocket quickly, less so for um, the cash flow, just keeping that in mind. All right. Now is the type, the time um, in this uh, course where I'm actually going to break down some deals on the market and um, show you some tools at your disposal. Again, this is more for beginners. However, I think intermediates could find something useful here too. Um, and so let's, let's go ahead and break it open. So if you look at my website here, 
Uh, if you scroll down again, invest with Tyler tab, you will see my cash flow models I have open to the public here. And you're going to see all these models. Well, this one right here I have open. And I, I love this model because it's really simple and easy. You only have to work with the areas in yellow. So any areas, don't mess with them. You might mess it up. Um, but I have here the year one numbers and then what it will look like year five using um, my assumptions. Well, we'll go ahead and find um, a property and uh, take a look at what we think we can give it for. So I have this property right here. Um, 245 Jefferson Ave on the near east side of Indianapolis. Um, and fairly basic property, um, but we're going to check it out. So first thing that I'm going to do, um, well, first I'm going to put the, uh, address in here. Bear with me. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so purchase price hundred forty five thousand dollars. Let's put that in over here too. And now I already have closing costs at about one point five percent. I think that's fairly accurate for Indiana. We have some of the low, lowest closing costs in the nation. Realtor fee on the buy, you don't have to pay a realtor fee. So now rehab costs. Um, now estimating rehab costs is beyond the scope of this um, video. However, um, I believe there's a J. Scott book on it. It's called literally the book on estimating rehab costs. Uh, also, you just get better with practice, but the roof looks mighty sketchy here. So I'm going to hope the roof's fine. But if I look at this property, I think we need some investment into this property. Um, this will also add some value. But um, let's just say in terms of like kitchen updates, um, better countertops, cabinets, flooring, um, and some other budget. We'll, we'll budget in um, $10,000, let's just call it. So you can add that in here. We want to add this in because this is part of our initial investment. So it's not just the down payment. It's also any money you're investing into it. Um, we're do, we're going to do a 25% um, down loan. Um, the reason I say 25%, not 20, is because... Um, I think making the numbers work in this market, it's easier to do it with 25% down if you can. Um, so we'll do 25% down. Um, typically investment loans are 20% down or above. Keep that in mind. Interest rate, um, let's just say I'm, I'm, I'm really falling on a budget and interviewing a lot of lenders and I get a 7% rate. It's probably lower for right now, but let's just say I use like a credit union or something. So 7% rate, uh, my rental income. now. How do you find rental income? A lot of people ask me this question. Well, here's what I use. I use rentometer.com. So it's free, I believe. You can do a paid account to access everything, but I think the free one is great. And you wanna make sure you're on house duplex, beds, we have a three bed, one bath. And this is spitting out these rent rates. Now I like to you go to the pro report and I like to actually search these properties. So I would I would uh, put them into like Redfin or Zillow, check them out, see if they have updated pictures and see where we're at. Um, and then I also would go on Zillow and check out what other um, places are asking. I'll actually do that here for this one. So let's go to rent and we'll go over to this area. town near Jefferson on the near east side. And just as I suspected, I thought rentometer seemed a little low. So let's take a look at this. They're asking part of a duplex, they're asking 1500 for this. Three bed, two baths, 1500 square feet. And then over here, they're asking 1100 for three bed, one and a half bath. Nothing special there. So I take those data points and I take these data points. In generally speaking, I find um, we're good landlords. Um, the people I work with at least, we're hungry to add value and provide a good experience. So generally we're between the median and 75th percentile. So that would put us 
around 1200. Um, and this is a three bed, one bath based on what these properties were asking and what I know about the area and the values you can get. Again, the benefit of using an investor friendly agent is that know how I, I do believe we can get this rent to 1300. I think that's a very safe estimate with the uh, value we're putting in there. So triaging between those. Sometimes Rentometer gives me a rent rate that I agree with wholeheartedly from the beginning when I do some of that due diligence and sometimes it doesn't. Um, it just depends in this instance, it thought it needed to be changed. Now this factors in some rental increases um, over time. So in five years, so you don't need to change that. I have 4% for vacancy. That's fairly on point based on what my property manager tells me. I have 15% in there for maintenance and repairs. Um, that would also include CapEx. So that's why it's 15. You generally put that number. I have 10% in there for property management, for real estate taxes. I think it's 1.5. Generally on some of these properties, um, it's, it's lower than 2%. However, 2% is a safe estimate. Owner occupants get 1% with the homestead um, exemption. Um, real estate investors usually run two to even two and a half. Now, some of these older properties that have had sudden increases in value your first year, it'll be closer to one, but I have 1.5 in there. Um, the, the place you can check um, is one with the realtor. A realtor could find that, or you can go to um, this website. Let's see, it'll pull it up. nd.gov slash workflow slash property taxes. And you can search the street name. Um, let's try it out and find the tax bill. Sometimes it will say zero if it was escrowed um, by the lender and it really wasn't zero, but okay. So it says zero here. So they didn't know anything because it was already paid at the time of this issuing. Um, Usually I believe Redfin and Zillow can show you the taxes or you just ask your agent, but I would, I would get the actual number for purposes of this. I usually just put in 1.5 or 2% homeowners insurance, um, for a single family home, three bedroom, one bath, smaller home, we're probably going to be around 1200 a year in the policy. Um, again, it says yearly. Um, for a larger, say duplex or something, maybe eight, 1800, 2000, it all depends on the rebuild costs. So you're going to want to talk to an insurance agent, but these are just general numbers. Um, and voila, as you can see, my monthly cash flow is negative 143. Now buying a rental property that is cash flowing is a little bit like finding a needle in the haystack right now. So. Keep that in mind. I'm, I'm not surprised at all. This is negative cash flow, but let's look at if we were self managing it. Let's say we live in town. Oh, we're still at negative 13. Okay. So that means that, um, even with managing ourselves, we're not making any money. So this would be a no go. I'm not buying this. Now, if this said it was a hundred dollars a month in cash flow, would that be a good deal? How would you know? Well, the way I'm seeing it right now in this market is if it's cash flowing positive and you're in the line of development appreciating, it's probably a good idea, deal. Of course, we want to maximize cash flow, but we don't want to get a really crappy property that pencils out on paper um, that isn't in the line of development, in my opinion, because you're making money through the cash flow, but also the appreciation. So keep that in mind. So let's just say, though, our rents with more updating. We could get them to um, 1550, let's just say. I have to invest maybe 20,000. Um, you probably have to invest more than 20,000 to get that rent rate on this property, but boom, we're at 124. So um, using Redometer and your comps is important for yourself, but using an investor friendly agent is going to be indispensable for getting some of this insider knowledge with the rent rate and how much to invest. Okay. Now I love this down here because it shows your total ROI and return, and that's going to include your yearly gains. So cash flow, appreciation, equity, pay down and tax benefit. Now this isn't perfect. So someone who really looks into this number might rip me to shreds here. 
it's imperfect, um, but I, I did make it the best I could to factor in. If you include all the ways your real estate is going to make money, um, what, what would that total ROI be? And this ROI is 26.7. So if you factor in appreciation, equity pay down, tax benefit, much stronger than just the cash and cash return. Um, you can also see five year expected property value based on um, these appreciation rates, um, which is helpful to, to pay attention to. But it's also important to look at the five year analysis because we're, we're not just investing for the year one pro forma or spreadsheet, we're investing for longer term. So I, I love to look at the five year and um, sometimes you want to make sure that all this has adjusted over here, but it appears like it has. And this is 252 in cash flow with a much stronger 5.2% in um, cash on cash return. Okay. Now there's a lot more to say here. Um, this is just one example um, of how to run the numbers, um, but you can um, obviously play around with this. Um, I do have in the website resources an Airbnb pro forma. I also have an apartment um, pro forma and even some other ones that I think are pretty cool, pretty useful um, to check out. But um, for the purposes of this video, the next thing I want to show you is some useful resources that are great, especially for beginners and intermediate on biggerpockets.com. So if you get an account on biggerpockets.com and get a premium membership, you can use, or excuse me, a, uh, I don't think it's a premium membership. It's the one below that. You can use their calculators. These are very similar to what I just did. They take you step-by-step step through it. Um, the Burr calculator is awesome as that's a little bit harder to navigate through. Um, I'm not going to do a Burr uh, demo right now on this one. I may in the future, but really easy to use. So biggerpockets.com slash tools is a great resource. Um, I'm on the forums like every day. So there's, there's an Indianapolis forum you can follow. Great to stay in the know. There's also a Facebook group. Um, I believe it's Indianapolis um, investment deals or something like that. I'm sure you can search that and find that. So if you want to get more well-connected, I do host um, investor meetups. So if you go to tylerlingle.com slash invest with Tyler, there's a sign up there. And I have an investor um, investor newsletter um, that I'm breaking down various properties and where the market's at. To get that, you can put your email in up here or down at the bottom here of my website and follow along with the newsletter. But for the most part, that is the um, content that I had for you guys today. I hope this was useful. Uh, it definitely was longer than I thought it would be by a lot. Um, so hopefully um, you got a lot of value. I will be doing a an, um, second edition where I'm going to clean up some of this. Um, so pay attention for that. Um, but I'd love to see you at the next Indie Investor Meetup um, or on the newsletter. Um, and if you need a solid investor friendly agent, please reach out to uh, me slash Roots Realty. Um, you can go to rootsrealty.co um, or tylerlingle.com and get connected to us there. Thanks so much, guys, and good luck out there.